Hello, and welcome to our Friday webinar. We are on today with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. Uh, welcome, Dr. Lamb. Hey, and a uh, very interesting and timely and important topic today, which is going to be the hormone. My hormones made me do it. <laughs> We're talking about ferret hormones, um, which which brings me to the question. Um, it, usually your little sidekick Arroyo is, is with us uh, on these webinars, and, and you want to tell us a little bit about... Um, where where Roy <laughs> why Royal's not behind you there and you've got some stand-in birds for <laughs> different friends today. They're a little quieter. Um their feathers are a little different, but it works. Uh, um so you know we're talking about hormone stuff today. And um you know hormones are a issue for everybody and uh arroyo himself has been a little bit hormonal uh to the point of it's probably better that right now he stay home um and you know take care of himself for a, a little bit you know he's not missing out on the day or anything and he's, he's fine and happy in his cage and uh you know having lots of things to to do throughout the day but sometimes when a bird is hormonal it's just a little safer for everybody and a little bit better uh to Sometimes, you know, let them do their own thing and kind of hang hang out uh, by himself. So that's why he's not here today. <laughs> uh, yeah, that would be a, a, a really um, interesting behind you. <laughs> like you, you, because, you know, you, you, yeah. be... you know, if you feel hormonal, sometimes they can be do some behaviors, which we're going to talk about um, that can be. Uh, not always so pleasant to deal with. And so we don't need any of that happening while we're doing the webinar today. Okay. Um, well, while we wait for people to log to log in or safely put their hormonal birds somewhere else in the house so they don't have to worry about something happening while they're paying attention to the webinar. Um, St. Patrick's Day is coming up Sunday uh, as it is. Um, I was going to do a little fun screen share real quick. And I was going to ask um, maybe people in the chat, uh, how many of you who are with us today, have, uh, their birds are already, um, they're not going to get pinched. They're, are, they're green. <laughs> there we go uh see so wait uh okay here we go you want to tell us what's uh what, what could be wrong with this photo of this um macaw let's see all right dr lamb what do you think here what's going on here uh that we <laughs> I mean, aside from the fact that if it, if it's drinking beer, that would definitely be a no, no, correct yeah. for no, 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 no Guinness or anything. I cannot like that. recommend that as a veterinarian for this bird. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, um, uh, but his feet are a little, uh, abnormal. You can see the one foot that's, uh, touching the ground there. He's got three feet, three toes forward and one toe back. And normally parrots, that's what's called a zygodactyl foot. And, um, or excuse me, that's an anisodactyl foot. And parrots are zygodactyl, meaning they have two forward and two back. So if this bird came into the office, I would be wondering if it's putting one of its toes forward because it's a little bit drunk from the <laughs> green beverage that it is consuming. Gotcha. And also, uh, just to point out, there are no uh, parrots native to Ireland. So... Um... <laughs> they 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 don't have any um parrots that you would i mean aside, aside from companion parrots um but uh but yeah let's see how many parrots have their their green on with their they, they uh oh also um um hats like hats on parrots that okay <laughs> On the parrot, you know, some parrots may be fine with you putting something on their head, and others are not into it at all. <laughs> I know it's good. So, in the wild, though, some birds do eat um, uh, fruit that's been right, the really ripe, overly ripened fruit that they, they, they have. I've seen stories of, of wild birds that have gotten drunk off of um, yes, off of the fruit, right? Is that yep, that has happened before, there have been reports of that, so. Um, I don't know if there've been any reports in parrots specifically. I think it was more like uh, other species of birds, but um, yeah, it has been reported before. It is something that, that happens occasionally in the wild, but hopefully not in our homes. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share here. And then uh, I'm gonna see how many birds, how many, uh, let's see. Um, we have any, uh, yeah, I think we have some some birds that are, I mean, 
there's so many, there's a lot of green birds. So they're all going to be set for Sunday when the, then no one's going to pinch those guys or they might give you the pinch, especially if they're hormonal. And with that, I'm going to let you take it away. Right. All right. Well, first thing um, on Sunday, it's also Arroyo's birthday. So oh my uh, gosh. Least, I, yes. So yes. So I, I uh, before we start the, the hormone talk, I took some pictures because uh, you guys are super nice and sent me um, some gifts for him. And so I took some videos of him interacting with his gifts at home since he wasn't going to be coming in today. Um, and so let me uh, share my screen and then I can show you those fun videos of everybody enjoying the awesome gift that you guys sent him. That's so. right. It's a Royals. 10th right 10th birthday it's his 10th birthday all right so um so this is the box that you guys had sent to me it's royal's birthday <laughs> favors got him a really nice gift it's a gift here here there's a little treat for you oh it's my goodness yeah hey, look there's some stuff in here that i think you'd really like they sent you a nice card a special gift <laughs> for our beloved bird and let's see what we've got in here. Oh, now you got his interest. <laughs> and he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> got some reading material. So that should be fun. And oh, look at this. Did you get a shirt? Oh. <laughs> I get a shirt. Hey, that's fun. See? The shirt. All right. I think I'll be the one wearing this. <laughs> but Arroyo, look. You got some fruit delight Asia cakes. Yeah. <laughs> you got some regular classic Asia cakes. You got garden veggie nutriberries, the tropical fruit nutriberries, and the sunny orchard nutriberries. Wow. I think you got some pretty good stuff for your birthday. But look what else you have. Oh, here comes the special moment, right? This is. Oh, look at that. That is beautiful. Remember that? You got a birthday cake last year. Did you get one again this year? And that's made of Nutriberries, is that correct? Yeah, Can it's made of Nutriberries and like the bottom is, it's more like, oh, like the Ava cake. And then the there's like Nutriberry so ring it. on top. Mm -hmm. So he was initially a little afraid of it and he didn't really want to touch it too much because he hasn't seen it for a year. So see how he's like really far away and like, mm, I'm gonna stay at this safe distance. So. I took some other videos of him later when he was feeling a little bit more comfortable, but here's one where I put it on his tree stand. <laughs> still, he's still not totally comfortable with it. He's like, I don't know. You have to think about this. <laughs> he's definitely intrigued. He's like, hmm. yeah. and then he finally decided, okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and go for it. He realized that it was <laughs> actually he's not as scary anymore. what he loves. <laughs> Yeah, now I love how he approaches it from the bottom, it. like <laughs> all for you. Yeah, but you're gonna have to share it with everybody else. But you're good at sharing stuff, huh? Oh my gosh, that is a nice looking yeah. uh, bird. I'm gonna call it a birthday cake, right? Yeah. <laughs> so then there it is up Here's close. Great cake again. Wow. Blueberries with it looks like dried peas and carrots. That is. Oh, that's a great po po oh, that point of view right there. I love it. <laughs> Good boy. So he was he was enjoying it much more comfortable with it at, at this point but it took it took a little bit because you know with a lot of parents they're afraid of new things and again even though we saw this before had something similar yeah. it was a year ago you know so yeah. it's again new and scary and something Maybe different Maureen could share some with you so it took <laughs> a little bit of time to get him used to it <laughs> well that is nice of him he's he's letting maureen partake in his yep his party here Look at that for, for, uh, I always, I always assume like gray, grays are more cautious than Amazon, but Maureen just went right in. <laughs> like, like, no, that's good. I'll, I'll eat it. Um, and then we get a little bit to share. Though. <laughs> Here's oh, 
Oh, look at that. He's like, you want wait, some too? Of course you do. Here. Yes, please. And then not even, uh, give me a little I'm gonna guy. share some of the cake as well with my little guys. So I'm going to break off a couple of pieces here of this great nutrient. <laughs> And we're going to put it into the cage. There's Atticus. All right. Now, Atticus is blind, so he uh, often has to go to his dish to get his food. He knows where his food is. It's just on the bottom of the cage here. And he has two little finch friends that live with him. And what I'm going to do is just break this little nutri berry up, kind of crush it. This one's a little bit more sticky because it has the uh, stuff to, to stick the uh, whole cake together. That one's a little harder. But we'll drop that in there. <laughs> Oh, look at the finch. <laughs> Pretty much immediately down. <laughs> as soon as my hand was out there, like, okay. <laughs> Isis and Jerry there. So Jerry and Isis. Royal's birthday cake, too. Here, guys, here, here's a little more. So it really is a party cake, a whole flock, whole flock, flock. It's a little easier for the finches. The finches absolutely can break through the nutri berries, but this makes it slightly easier when I crush it up. Again, this one just has the sort of sticky stuff to stick it all together, making it a little harder for me to crunch it up like I normally do. Oh, wow. Yeah, they, uh, that's pretty yummy. We'll have to see if we can get the recipe. I think people are asking for the, uh, the cake <laughs> recipe. Let's see. That's the birthday cake. All right, so, but now let's go ahead and get into the, the webinar that we're here for today. Um, okay, so again, because it's a uh, hormone season, um, we wanted to talk about hormones. I know we've already had a couple of lectures on it from our other speakers on hormones, but what we're going to do today is try to take it more from like the bird's point of view, um, because I think it is something that is really confusing and kind of scary for people sometimes. Um, when we hear that our bird's hormonal, we can be sometimes worried that there's a lot of problems and we may equate a lot of you know, bad things going on with it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Um, remember that hormones are natural. Um, they are totally normal. They don't have to be this, you know, negative thing, this bad thing in any way. Um, and when we understand why they're happening, it makes us a little more understanding, less afraid of what's going on, and then we can really learn how to deal with it better. Um, so what I'm first going to do is just go over, oh, yes, there we go. Uh, I'm just first going to go over just some of the basic things that tell a bird to be hormonal, and then we're going to, you know, flip it around and go from the scientific side. This is first the scientific side of what we know, and then we're going to flip it around to really more the bird side um, and how the birds are feeling and, and try to get into their heads, hopefully. And, you know, I am going to be anthropomorphizing a little bit. Um, some people don't like it when we anthropomorphize, which is where we are, um, thinking of animals with some human characteristics and, and thinking of it from, thinking about animal behaviors from like a human lens. Um, you know, some people frown upon that, but I think it does sometimes serve some, some purpose that it's not also so horrible to anthropomorphize because sometimes when we do anthropomorphize, it makes us, again, be a little more understanding of, hey, if I was in that situation, how would I act, you know? Um, so I don't think it's totally awful, and but uh, I, uh, bear with me. There may be some things that I also, you know, don't get quite right because I'm not a bird. Um, and so I am making some assumptions about things and, and things may be variable from one individual slightly to the next. So, um, but why do birds do what they do? Um, well, when it's that right time of year, uh, there are various signals in the wild that will tell a bird that, hey, this is the time to be hormonal. And if the bird is of an appropriate age as an adult, um, then they're going to really key into these environmental cues that tell them this is the right time for me to, you know, find a mate, you know, pair up and have babies. And those various environmental cues involve things like light, heat, humidity, uh, food sources, nesting materials, the presence of a mate, or potentially even just hearing a mate. So 
um, how does light affect them? Well, as the day length increases, this means that there's more light, right? And so that light actually stimulates the eyes um, and a gland in the brain called the pineal gland and possibly light stimulates even deeper in the brain. So when light stimulates those eyes, the pineal gland and possibly deeper, it then actually has an effect on melatonin cycling within, within the brain and within the body. And melatonin um, may play a role in stimulating or suppressing reproductive cycling. So kind of depending upon the like what level of melatonin is present, then you may be stimulating the immune system or you may be suppressing the um, reproductive cycling. Uh, generally, less light means there's going to be more melatonin. And melatonin actually stimulates a particular hormone called gonadotropin inhibiting hormone. And so when there's less light, there's more melatonin, more melatonin stimulates this uh, inhibiting hormone, and then that inhibiting hormone suppresses the release of certain reproductive hormones. So there's a very scientific uh, reason why light has this effect on reproductive drive and reproductive cycling. Um, so, you know, what does that really mean for a bird? Well, if it's darker for longer, it may not be the right time um, for them to feel hormonal and thus they don't really wanna have any babies. They're not really engaging in hormonal activities. Um, but if it's lighter for longer, well, now it might be the time for them to be hormonal and to think about having babies uh, because those melatonin levels are lower, which means that gonadotropin inhibiting hormone is lower, which means those reproductive hormones can be higher. Okay, well, what about heat? Um, heat means that in the warmer parts of the year, uh, there is going to likely be more light. You know, it's also associated with, you know, just our natural uh, seasons that we have. Um, so more light and more heat means that there's more plants that are gonna be growing. And if there's more plants, well, then there's probably more food available for uh, animals and thus more resources for those animals who are using those food items. Um, and if there's more resources and more food available, that means a bird has the food to feed its babies. Uh, for humidity also can play a role for certain individuals. For some birds, more moisture means there will be more plants growing. Um, and again, if there's more plants growing, it means there's more food. If there's more food, it means there's an abundance of resources for um, birds to be feeding their young. Um, and so, you know, that can be a signal for some species that it is time for us to lay. Uh, for other birds, more moisture means that the heavy rain season is starting. And if the heavy rain season is starting, it, 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 you know, you don't, that's not always a favorable thing in certain parts of the world. It may not be the right time to have young as environmental conditions can sometimes be a little bit more tough, you know, in certain parts of the world when it's rainy season, I mean, there is a lot of water, um, which may not be the best environment to be having babies. So it's um, variable, you know, and it, that's why you may hear sometimes some mixed things of where humidity can help or humidity doesn't help. Um, it's because it depends on the species, um, where they are like naturally. And, and then the other reality is, is that um, captivity sometimes throws things off, you know? Um, so it, hum altering humidity works for some, but not for others to make them feel more or less hormonal. Uh, food sources. Hey, here's a picture actually of last year's uh, um, Nutriberry uh, Ava Cake cake uh, that you guys had sent. And this was uh, when Emo was enjoying a little bit by herself. But um, why are food sources something that can stimulate hormones? Well, the more food that's available, the more food they have to feed their young, right? As we already talked about with um, more moisture in some places of some parts of the world or more uh, heat, more light, it usually means more plants are growing. And if more plants are growing, I have more food available to feed my babies. Um, so, you know, if we think about it from sort of, again, the scientific 
side of things. If more food is usually seen during times of longer day length because more photosynthesis is happening, the, the growth and development of our plants, warmer temperatures tend to be more ideal for uh, plant growth. Um, of course, depends on what particular plant we're talking about, where in the world we're talking about. Um, and again, that higher moisture, it, it's providing enough uh, moisture for those plants uh, to grow. Uh, nesting material. How can nesting material sometimes be um, uh, hormonal for them? Well, it, it can be hormonal because, you know, if they see an object that might be like a nest or nesting material, and that can include things like nesting boxes, small cavities that they may interpret as a great place that looks like a nest, uh, small containers, you know, can sometimes look like a cavity. It may not actually be a cavity, um, but the bird is interpreting it as a little cavity because it's a nice, perfect little thing that they can get themselves into, um, or shredding material. Um, you know, all those things can be interpreted as nest, as, as a nest or nesting material. And hey, if we have these materials around, why not take advantage of them? If I've got this great nest right here, hey, this, this could potentially be something that stimulates me to think that I, I think I want to use that nest. I think I, I think I want to actually take advantage of this resource that I have available to me um, so that I can have some babies. Um, the presence of a mate. If, you know, a bird has a mate around and it's with them, why not raise a family, you know? Um, why not Why not take advantage of the fact that we have this mate that's so perfect and wonderful right next to us that, yeah, maybe we, we should uh, think about having some babies. And then for some individuals, it's just hearing uh, the mate. Um, if a mate is in within distance, hey, why not pair up? And, and think again about, you know, our birds in the wild when they are, you know, trying to pair off and find mates. Uh, certain species are going to be potentially calling for mates. Now, a lot of our citizen birds that live in more of these flocks, um, you know, they, they, they may not um, necessarily always have to have that hearing a mate be a cue, it may be more seeing the mate. But I put a picture of a cockatiel here because there's actually studies that have shown that a female cockatiel just hearing their mate or hearing a male cockatiel can be stimulus enough for, hey, I hear a mate, like, that can actually make them start to go into hormonal mode. Just simply hearing it, not seeing, not seeing a male, just hearing them can make them want to become hormonal. Um, and if a mate is within distance, well, you know, why not pair up? Um, they may feel like they need to find him or her, you know, feel really um, anxious about it. I mean, that happens with mammals too. You know, uh, with mammals, sometimes it's more about like smelling them. We don't think about scent too much in our birds because a lot of our birds don't have the greatest sense of smell. It does, again, depend upon what species we're talking about, about how much sense of smell they have. But when we're talking about our parrots, most of them don't have the best sense of smell, at least, you know, humans actually are a little better than birds when it comes to sense of smell. But some other mammals, like, you know, if a male smells a female, they may get really excited um, and really feel a desire to, to get to that individual. So, um, you know, a little bit differences from uh, mammals to birds, but not that much of a difference. Um, so, okay. <laughs> talking about all the the scientific things of why you know all the, all these scientific things that we know what will make them hormonal or have the potential to make them hormonal all these signals tell them um it's time for us to be hormonal we're going to simulate these changes um now it may result in some behavioral changes in our birds that we see that can be sometimes weird for us. Sometimes we just don't know what this new behavior is that I've never seen my bird do before. I've been living with my bird for X amount of time for so several years. I've had him since he was a baby, you know, and every he's always done this particular behavior, but now suddenly this new behavior has come about. Um, that can be sometimes just odd and really confusing for an owner, or sometimes it can be scary for an owner um, because, hey, why are you doing this behavior that I've never seen before? Are you sick? Are you ill? 
or are you just mean all of a sudden? Um, which I think is probably one of the things that people have the hardest problem with um, is that sometimes when birds are hormonal, they, they can feel a little nippy or, or act a little nippy and we'll get into why. Um, but, you know, that could be misunderstood by us humans who we think of our birds oftentimes as our children. So many think people, including myself, um, you know, I'm guilty of it as many other people are. Think of our birds as our children. We get these animals, these pets um, that we just want to love and do everything for and make their life just perfect. Um, but they don't think of us as their owners. They think of us many times when we've treated them like they're our children. Many times they start to think of us like their mates because we have provided such a fabulous environment and we may really be coddling them and loving them so much. Um, that we're really having these intense bonds with them that they go, hey, this person's great. I think I'm gonna have this person be my mate. And then, you know, it can cause some behavioral issues that just make people uh, start to go, hold on, what, what is happening now? This is really weird. And we may misunderstand it as um, something that is, worse than what it actually is. So now the question is when these birds are doing these behaviors, they've listened to all those environmental cues that told them it's time to be hormonal. Now we have these behavior changes that are happening. What is the bird actually saying to you with, with some of those uh, behavior changes that we're seeing? So now we're gonna get into the slightly anthropomorphizing side of things. And again, this, this is uh, where, um, it's not going to necessarily all this is going to apply to every single bird that's out there. Um, this is going to apply maybe just a couple things here or there apply to your bird, but this particular thing doesn't apply to your bird. So um, keep in mind that there is a lot of variability from one individual to the next. And birds are just as complex as us when it comes to behavioral stuff. I mean, you know, no one would ever say that all people are gonna act the same way, right? Because we're all individuals, we're all unique. We all have different experiences birds are the exact same thing. Um, so let's get into it. All right. So when it comes to hiding, sometimes we owners find our birds hiding in little cavities and corners. And so if I am the bird um, and I am uh, looking around my environment and I find this great little tiny cavity or hole or dark space, I might be looking at that from afar and going, you know what? That looks like a really nice place to move into, the perfect place to have my babies. I think I'm going to go ahead and move into that small little cavity over there and first check it out. So what you may see as an owner is initially your bird walking over to maybe like a, a bathroom or a closet or inspecting a drawer um, or inspecting behind something, you know, looking behind like a chair or looking behind like a computer that's up against a wall. Um, they're really trying to get behind or around things really because they're checking places out, trying to say, is this a good place for me to go around and you know, potentially have my babies? Is this a, is this a nice environment? Would my beloved human uh, who I'm thinking of as my mate want to move in here with me? Maybe they could fit in here. Um, and then once they get into some of these places, you might find that they do a lot of destruction. Um, and the reason they're doing that destruction is because now that I'm inside that cavity and I'm looking around, I think I'm going to do a little bit of remodeling. I mean, think about it. You know, if you move into a new home, are you going to keep that home the exact same way that some other person who lived there before uh, had it? Probably not. You're probably going to change things around and reshape it and remodel it to the way that you want it to be. Set things up in different areas. That's what they're doing when they go into these little cavities and they start, you know, chewing at pieces of the wall or picking off uh, papers or, or just, you know, in our minds, destroying things that we wouldn't want them to destroy. Um, it's just because they're trying to remodel this great nest that they just found. That's the perfect place to potentially have you move in with them um, and or whoever, you know, they might have a toy that's their favorite thing or they might have um, another bird and they need to make this new cavity a perfect place to, to bring their friend or whoever into. Which gets us into 
the shredding. Um, so it's very common that, um, you know, most people who own parrots know their bird is going to destroy stuff. And, you know, some level of destruction is often accepted by most people that, yeah, they're going to chew up these particular items. They're going to chew up um, these toys that I give them. Um, I've had, I have had some owners actually get upset by the birds chewing up the toys too much, um, that they went through the toys too quickly. Um, and, you know, it becomes expensive when they go through their toys rather, rather quickly. But it is, again, a natural, normal behavior. Um, and some level of shredding in a non-nest-like environment is fine, totally normal. Um, just normal things that they would be doing, not necessarily associated with hormones. But when you have a bird, again, in a small cavity, um, depending upon the species, some, piece, some species will uh, shred things outside of a cavity to take it to a cavity, but a lot of them will do it in some sort of cavity, like this picture that I have of Maureen here where, um, she was at work one day and somebody had a box and they had put this empty box down on the um, countertop and she looked at it and made a beeline for it, went right in and was like, yeah, this is a great box. I think I'm going to remodel it. And, you know, you can tell that this is more of a uh, hormonal behavior because she's in the box and shredding it. She's not outside the box. She's in the box. And so, um, you know, I think after I snapped this photo, I removed her from the box. And if I remember correctly, I did get a little bit of a nip because I just took her out of the box as she was working really hard to remodel to make it to what she wanted. This is a totally normal behavior for a bird to do. And 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 um, on you know some level is acceptable um, for them to chew things up. Um, but you know, when when you see it again with them inside of a cavity, it's probably because they are feeling a little hormonal. Hormonal, and again, they are just trying to make it nice for themselves for however they think it's going to be appropriate uh, to have all this nice little shredded material around that they can then sit in and dream about their uh, future babies. Okay, what about eating more? Um, well, sometimes we will see birds eating more, and, and here's a picture of a royal really enjoying some little snack that somebody had made for him. Um, and, you know, some birds, like a lot of Amazons, eat a lot all the time, but other birds don't. Uh, and, and during hormone season, you might find that your bird is eating more than what it used to. Um, and initially that can sometimes be odd, like, you know, maybe if you put down a certain volume of food and it goes, they go through it quicker, or you've noticed um, that the amount that they left behind is less than what they usually used to leave behind before. Um, it's really because they're needing to take in more calories because of a couple of things. One thing that makes them feel a little bit more like I need to eat a li little bit more is because I need to have some nice food to feed my new love, whoever that new love is, or old love, you know, um, they may be wanting to take that food in so that they can feed it to whoever they think their mate is or whatever object they think their mate is. Um, and because why are they doing that? Why are they bringing this food up to, to feed to other individuals? Because it's strengthening the pair bond. When I am a, if I'm a bird, if I'm eating more of this food, I'm getting my calories, but I'm also getting some additional calories for my friend. And I'm going to give this extra wonderful food um, that's warm and moist to my beloved friend here who I want to be my mate or is my mate. I am showing affection towards them. I am showing them a gift. I am showing them that this is, you know, you're the greatest thing in the world. Then the other thing that makes them want to eat more is because I have a lot of babies I need to feed. You know, it, certain species lay more eggs than others. Um, some have fewer babies, some have more babies, but no matter how many babies you have, you gotta feed them. Um, and so they may be searching more for food, eating more because they are wanting to kind of be ready to be feeding all, all these babies that are going to be uh, present. Or if they think they have some object that is like a baby in their enclosure that they may be feeding something to, um, again, they're just maybe, um, taking in more calories so that they can uh, feed whatever 
baby it is they think they have some food because they're a good parent and they need to take care of their offspring. Okay, so biting. This is a this is a big one that I think is um you know really difficult um for us owners. Um and you know I include myself in in saying that because um nobody likes to get bit. Nobody finds anything enjoyable about being bit by a bird um, or any animal, in all honesty, right? Nobody likes to be bit by anything because it hurts, right? Um, and so this can stimulate a lot of emotions in us when we do get bit that, oh my gosh, my bird doesn't like me. It's automatically the first thing many people think um, is, oh my gosh, they hate me. They really don't want to have me around anymore. Um, I am really sad because I love my bird and I've given my bird all this love and attention and I've done so much for it. And now they're biting me and it hurts. They may be drawing blood. I don't like this. This is really upsetting for me. Why would they do this? So from the bird side of things, it can mean a couple of different things. It's not just um, one hard and fast, hey, I'm biting and it means this exactly. It can actually mean a lot of different things things. So we have to kind of look at the context to see what it could potentially mean. Um, but one of the things is they're saying, stay away from my nest. This is my nest. This is my area. I don't want you in here right now because I have staken a claim to this area. You've got your own place. Why don't you go hang out in your own place? This is my place. I don't need you here right now because I'm doing some work in this house, <laughs> you know, when they're shredding all this stuff all around it. Um, I need to protect it. This is for me and my family. Um, it is my resource. I see this as a resource. I don't want you coming towards this nest and I don't want you bothering me. The other thing it could potentially mean is stay away from my food. I don't want you near my food right now. This food is for me, again, this is a resource. I need this resource because, hey, maybe I want to chew it up and uh, regurgitate it to whoever my favorite individual is in the home um, or object or bird. You know, I need to feed my love. This is for my mate. It is not for you. It is for me. And I need to protect this resource. Even though as a human, we may know that there's a bag of pellets or, you know, a bag of whatever food item or fresh food all around that is just in the kitchen that we can go and get and get more food. Why would this animal seem so uh, protective of it? It's because to them, this is a resource. I need to protect this particular resource. I'm saving it for whatever reason I feel like I need to save it for, again, for my mate or for my family or just for myself um, because I'm really thinking about my mate and my family and I need to have calories for me too. Um, I need to protect this resource uh, from you because I don't really want you by my food right now. Even if I like you just fine and we are a flock and we are friends, I need to protect you from this food because this is mine. Um, the other thing that can happen uh, that could potentially be going through their minds when they bite is saying, stay away from my mate. This thing, this human, this object, uh, or this other bird, this is my mate. Again, another resource of mine that I have staken claim to, and I don't want you to touch this person, bird, object, because it's mine, and I am going to raise a family with this individual. I don't want you touching this, this individual. Stay away. They're mine. Um, and I think that's often a really hard one for families, human families, um, where we have a family, you know, um, of multiple people living together. And maybe there's one person in the family, or maybe somebody got the a bird as a pet. And initially, it was meant for the family, everybody in the family was meant to 
um, care for this individual, or maybe, you know, one person was meant to do the vast majority of the work caring for the bird. Um, but it was really meant to be a family pet that everybody would get to enjoy this individual. But the bird picks out one person that they think of as their mate. And, you know, it, it could potentially be the person that's providing the most um, care, but it could potentially be somebody else in the home. There might be something else that that bird finds attractive in some way um, or something that they really desire from this other person that maybe has like no interest in the, the bird. I, I have definitely encountered that many times where a family got a bird, one individual was supposed to be the primary caretaker of this bird, and they have been the primary caretaker of this bird, but then hormone season hit and the bird started biting when the other person who has like no interest in being, uh, or not a large interest, I should say, uh, in caring for the bird being around, uh, they, you know, they're coming around and, and the bird seems to be being really uh, drawn towards them. It almost seems like, you know, they may be trying to sit with them more or walk towards them more or really want to hang out with them and not want to hang out with another person uh, that was their primary uh, person who was supposed to take care of them. Um, and that can cause a lot of stress for owners and make people sad because, hey, I'm the one who's taking care of you. Why are you now biting me, but really loving this person who doesn't do a lot of care for you? Um, and it's just because that bird has decided that that person is great in some way um, to to be the mate. And they're just telling you, hey, that that person's mine. I need to protect that person. I don't want you around them. Um, I need you to go over there. and. You know, sometimes they'll be fine when that person isn't around. You can interact with the bird, okay, but as soon as that person comes around, now they're biting. Um, so try not to take it too personal. Um, try to to think of it as they're just hormonal. You know, they they right now are going through a time where in their mind they are biting, not because they dislike you, not because they're really trying to hurt you, um, because they have other thoughts in their head right now that are a little more important than you being around, and they need you maybe to go away, or they maybe need you to go somewhere else, or sometimes they do have um, uh, they will bite the person who is their favorite when other people are um present and they may be resource guarding you as the favorite individual uh, because they don't want other people coming to take you and they may be trying to like ward you away like hey you need to get away from this person I need you to move over there I need you to go back to hang out in our our fabulous nest that I've been building for the both of us um, to to uh you know go raise a family um and we don't need that person around right now so so sometimes these these biting events happen in various different contexts and it is definitely different from one bird to the next so just because you have a bird biting it, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are you know that where you're happening it is at the nest or it is that you know you're not the favorite one or you are the favorite one um, or there's around food it, it can happen in all these different ways mostly because of there being some sort of, of re some sort of resource that they feel like um, is they need to protect or shoo somebody away from um, because it's theirs and they are feeling hormonal and they need to they need to stake a claim on it. So um, uh, as you know uh, from from a personal standpoint, dealing with uh, my own birds, um, my one of my African greys, uh, Gigi, she really prefers my husband. Um, he is like the best thing in the world. Um, and for the longest time, she used to bite me quite a bit um, when I was just around, when he was around. But if he wasn't around, then it was fine. Then I would never get bit. Um, and it took actually a few years of kind of trying to figure out how to shape and mold that behavior um, before it really stopped. And now she like 
never bites me anymore. We have a um, much better understanding of, of how to interact, but it took some time. And, um, you know, initially it was a little stressful for me because I, I just wanted to love this bird. I thought she was the greatest thing in the world, um, but she didn't want that for me. And it was really important for me to recognize that, not feel offended by it and figure out a different way to interact with her and be a part of the flock, um, but not uh, be too uh, I don't know whether I could say, um, of a threat to her or, um, uh, insulting in some way. Um, and, you know, things are fine now, but it took a little bit of time. Uh, from the other standpoint, I would say right now with my Amazon Arroyo, I've had, he just turned 10 again, his birthday on, uh, or his birthday on Sunday. Um, but I had nine and not a little over nine years of him really not acting all that hormonal, like a couple little hormonal things there here and there, but really no, no major problems that I would say. Um, and just this last year, he decided to become hormonal in a way that involves him sometimes taking a good bite, uh, from me. And it's really important for me to, um, not get too emotional and upset about it, even though I want to, and I do, um, I have to take a step back and say, hey, why is this happening? What can I do to adjust the environment, to alter the way that I'm interacting so that we don't have this behavior that is, um, he's doing it because he feels it's important for whatever reason. How can we change the way we're interacting so that we don't run into this being a problem? Um, and we can go about life happy. <laughs> so um, biting is a very complex one, and I, I don't think any of us have all the answers. Um, so I, I hope, though, that in going over what maybe the bird might be thinking about biting um, could help some people to understand a little bit more so that we don't go to, well, this is just an aggressive, mean bird, and they're horrible, and we need to get rid of them. Because it is something that commonly happens where birds get rehomed um, frequently because of these behaviors that we don't like that are incompatible with what we would think is appropriate for a pet. Um, but when we step back and recognize why they're happening and what may be going through the bird's mind, then we that allows us to go, well, what can I do to make it so that they don't feel this way so that maybe we don't have the behavior happening? Or how can I adjust my environment to recognize that this is gonna happen during certain times and I know how to respond appropriately so that we don't run into such um, problems that ultimately result in a bird being rehomed somewhere. Okay, off of the biting subject and on to the regurgitation. Um, so there are a lot of birds who, um, when they're eating more, will take that food and take it to, again, a person, another bird or an object and start to bring it up. And they do this like head bobbing thing. And if nobody has uh, experienced it before, if you haven't had this happen with your bird, it can be a little scary the first time it happens. And I absolutely have had owners rush into the office before because the bird's throwing up because they start bobbing their head, getting a little crazy. And then all of a sudden they bring something up. Um, and you know, from our perspective, oh my gosh, this is scary. Why would a bird vomit when it's like trying to be hormonal? But in a bird's mind, what they're doing is they're storing all that food in the crop. They're getting it nice and full. It's moist, it's warm. And then they're going to bring it to you because providing you with this warm, moist, uh, hot food um, is a way for them to show that they love you or an object and they want to give you this gift. It is a way for them to sort of cement uh, a little bit of bonding to, to happen. And they want to, they want to share, they want to share their food uh, with you, an object or another bird that they think of as, as their mate. And it's just them saying, hey, here's this fabulous gift please take it. I, I hope you, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so it seems weird and it seems scary if you've never had to uh, deal with it or it's their first time dealing with it, but it is a, uh, just a, a bonding thing that happens. And okay, what about feather destruction? Okay. This one's also like biting a very complex thing. And I want to start this off by saying that um, this 
little moment of conversation is not uh, something that will explain why all birds do feather destructive behavior because there are so many reasons that a bird can destroy its feathers. It's just that hormones are one of the things that we commonly see causing them to destroy their feathers, but it is by and far not the only thing that causes them to destroy their feathers and, and engage in these particular activities. Um, but when I have a bird coming into the office and I am talking to an owner about uh, all the possibilities of what could be causing them to pick their feathers, and we are, you know, I'm asking a lot of questions of the environment and things that are going on, and I'm doing my physical exam, I'm really trying to narrow things down as to what could be causing them to, to do this behavior. If I come to the conclusion that it, this could potentially be as a result of hormones, well, then the next question is, is why? Why does feather destruction have anything to do with, with hormones? Um, and there's probably many reasons that we don't have all the answers for, but I can give at least a couple of little answers. Um, the first thing is that could potentially be going through their mind at, at various points is, well, I might want to be pulling just a couple of little feathers or destroying just a little few couple of feathers to help line my nest. Now, there are certain species of birds that that do pick a brood patch. Parrots aren't really thought to be one of the main species or groups of birds that that does that, at least um, with some of the current knowledge that we have. Um, it's honestly kind of more like an owl thing um, and a couple of other you know species here and there. Um, but still, it does seem like sometimes um, I have known some breeding birds who right around that breeding season do seem to, parrots seem to pluck a few feathers that they do kind of have in their nest. Now, whether it's they, that it fell in the nest because, um, you know, the bird was just standing there or if it was an intentional thought, that's really hard for me to say. But, you know, it, it could it could potentially be that the thoughts going through their mind of just a couple little feathers in here in this nest to make it a little softer, a little lighter for my young to be to be on the nest as a as a possibility. The other possibility of what could be going through their mind of why feather destructive behavior is causing them to to do this feather damage um, is because of frustration. Um, and, and this is a really difficult one for us to totally understand. But if I go and again, try to anthropomorphize and put myself in the mind of this bird um, who is living in a human world, um, in a home, not in a tree, in a cage where they have had to even I mean the best environments that we you know provide for our birds um, that are appropriate and, and acceptable and okay, it's still inside of a home. Um, and if they're if they have you know something that they perceive as a nesting box or nesting material, and they have all this abundance of food, and they have you know um, appropriate heat and humidity and things that make them feel just really ideal, and they have this wonderful person who is they're thinking of as their mate again while well, we're thinking of this this is my my pet or my child this you know in in their mind this is my mate this is who i want to be with this is who i want to you know have move into this nest that i've created inside of this home um and i want to feed them and i want to uh you know mate and i want to have these babies and i want to raise a family um and this person isn't getting it well, now i'm frustrated um, I'm frustrated because I am not completing this natural behavior that I'd like to be completing. Um, this is what I imagine probably goes through some of their minds. And again, this is me anthropomorphizing, and I don't have any way to, to um, really say that that's what's actually going on. And it definitely doesn't sound scientific at all. Um, but you know, when we when we stop and we we put ourselves in their places and we think about what they go through um, and what their experiences are and their life is like, and if I was put in that situation, how would I act? 
I think it does, I think a little bit of anthropomorphizing is okay because then it makes us understand them a little bit more. Um, and so, so sometimes I just don't know what to do. And now that I'm frustrated, I'm just gonna pick this feather out, you know, or, or chew this feather because it's something to do. And it's a displacement behavior that comes about because it's something for me to take my mind off of other stuff or something to give me just something to do throughout the day. Um, and again, when I'm talking about feather destruction, I, I have to say it over and over that there's so many different causes for feather destruction and hormones is an underlying reason for causing them to destroy them, their feathers. It's just one of the many things that could be a cause and a problem and, and a contributing factor. So, um, you know, it's, it's so complex. We're absolutely not going to solve it in this very short little webinar. Um, and, and um, you know, it, it definitely is something that's individually uh, determined um, are different causes for each individual. Okay, next thing that we may see our birds doing that make us go, huh, that's weird, um, is rubbing their bottom on things. Um, I, I put there, I probably don't need to explain this one, and I, I, I think that's probably the case. I think most people understand that when a bird is uh, rubbing its bottom on something, uh, what is actually happening. I did not have any pictures of birds doing that behavior, so I instead put up this cute ceramic parrot. <laughs> Um, I love that, by the way. <laughs> um, so, but I mean, you know, if a bird's rubbing its bottom on something, it's a weird behavior that owners may see and not totally understand. It is probably masturbating is what's actually likely happening there. Um, and some females kind of do another thing where they like, uh, will do panting behaviors in certain females and like, or certain species and like hunker down and put their little wings out. Um, and it can be scary the first time you, you see it um, and not understand it, but it's a, um, it is a mating behavior um, and it is, you know, something that's natural that happens. Okay, um, so ultimately, knowing the scientific side and knowing, you know, maybe the, or postulating and thinking about what the birds could be thinking and, and putting ourselves in, in I want to say their shoes, but they don't wear shoes, so... Um, in their toes, um, you know, what, what should we do to try and help um, these hormonal behaviors and, and help during times of hormones so that we can live a more harmonious life together and, and be happy? Um, well, we want to alter the cues that stimulate them to be hormonal. And we've certainly talked about that many times. And I know in the other webinars, is, you know, things were discussed about how we can alter those cues. We go back to what is the cause, what are the cues that make them feel hormonal, and how can we alter those cues to make them feel less hormonal? Model. The other thing that I think is extremely important is to um, just be understanding. When they are feeling hormonal, um, in, uh, you know, you don't want to label them as an aggressive bird, a bad bird, a bird that all it does is bites. Um, we hear those things all the time. And, you know, there's a reason behind those behaviors. There's always a reason behind behaviors. And it's a matter of figuring out what that reason is. And if it's hormones, this is a natural thing that happens. Maybe we don't like it. Um, and we maybe need to work on altering the cues that make them feel hormonal. Um, but, you know, be understanding when it does happen, because it will happen. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm having to deal with it. And I've, you know, been working with birds for a, a little while now and went to school and became a veterinarian. I'm a board certified avian veterinarian. And I have to talk with owners about this stuff all the time, and yet I deal with it too in my own home, in my own birds. I try to make the environment as unhormonal as possible, and yet I still have to deal with it. So when we when we recognize that and we start to be a little bit more understanding that this is somewhat this is natural, it, it's it's something we can work around. Um, we also need to work on reading their body language uh, and communicating with birds to reduce those behaviors that we don't want to see. I put biting in, I put biting because it's the one that's the most offensive to people. Um, and we want to redirect their attention to behaviors that you do like to see that are more acceptable to, to deal with. All right, so that is it. Um, I will stop sharing my screen. Does anybody have any questions? Um, okay, so we do have a quest, uh, question from Alex. Um, they have a male and female orange-fronted conures. Um, so each year around the end of December, the female lays eggs, and she's about 10 years old. She's been laying eggs since 2018. Um, they're worried she might have one of the chronic egg-laying problems. So um, is the, I might, 
pronounced it wrong. Uh, the Deslorian uh, implant safe for such a small conure? Would you recommend the implant in the case of chronic egg laying? Um, and do you recommend the use of dummy eggs for the same reason? Uh, and if uh, yes, where do you, um, where can you read about the correct use of using fake eggs? Is there a, a thing in that? Yeah. Um, so first it would be good to know like what possible hormonal uh, or egg related pathology is going on because that does make a little bit of a difference. And if I'm saying, yes, I think we should do Deslorelin or not. Generally speaking, the majority of the time, I really try to have owners work on behavioral modifications uh, first because, well, it doesn't cost a lot of money to, uh, you know, in medical bills uh, to do behavioral modifications. And it certainly does cost money for, for um, doing the hormonal therapies, but there certainly are birds who need the hormonal therapy and Deslorelin absolutely is a, um, a hormone that can be used to suppress hormonal drive. Um, it's not 100% perfect. There's a certain percentage of birds that don't respond to it. And the, with repeated use, I'm going to say this as a uh, subjective opinion, with repeated use, it seems like the length of time that it works for it gets shorter and shorter. Uh, but I don't know that we have really great studies to say that as a definitive thing yet, but we probably will in the future. Um, but you can put it in a green tree conure. I have put it in as little as a small as a finch. I have put it into a zebra finch before. Um, so that is something you can do. And then as far as using the egg, the, the dummy eggs, you can. The, the purpose of the dummy eggs is to make them, like if you, uh, for some birds, there's determinate layers and indeterminate layers. Determinate layers count the number of eggs that they lay. Indeterminate layers do not count the number of eggs that they lay. And so the thought is with the determinate layers, if you put down, like say a bird's gonna lay normally six eggs, you put down six eggs, it's supposed to make them not want to lay. And then because they are not laying, they're not uh, potentially overexpending uh, their body resources and running into a lot of hormonal uh, or potential egg-related laying problems. Um, so that's the point of the dummy eggs, but like a green cheek conure is, to my knowledge, not a determinant layer. Um, it's an indeterminate layer, so I don't think they really count their eggs so much, so it may not work as well to stop them from going through that um, uh, laying cycling, but the, the point is to make them think that, hey, the, the, I already laid the number of eggs I wanted to lay, so I don't need to lay anymore, so... Um, I'm good. I'm just going to sit on these eggs. So you can experiment with your bird and see if putting those out would stop them from laying. Um, but it might not work in a green cheek on your. Okay. All right. And then we have a question from Jody. Uh, why is placing implants in a bird's breast area cause um, an increased risk of complications and is not advised? hormone implant in the breast muscle. Um, I don't know that it causes an increased risk. I don't know that we can say that. Um, generally speaking, people have put it between the shoulder blades um, because it's just underneath the skin. Um, the I don't know that there really is an increased risk of putting it into the breast muscle. I will say I prefer to put it in the shoulder blades because in my mind, I think to myself, well, the pectoral muscle mass is the muscle that powers flight, you know? Um, and so like putting this big needle with this implant in there, like is that comfortable long term? You know, I so so, but I don't know that it actually truly causes a problem if you put it in the pectoral muscle mass. Um, so I prefer to put it in the back, uh, but I don't know if there's a true contraindication. Okay, okay, and and I, I just I had a so, let's say your bird bites you, nips you uh, when they're hormonal. What would you recommend as a reaction from like should? You, so you know, like you don't you don't, you don't want to reward uh, excessive screaming behavior, right? By coming into the bird, like do you turn your back to them? Do you you also probably need to kind of deflate the situation, like take a deep breath, and yeah, it is you don't important. have a like a, a shouting reaction. So how do you react if your bird nips or bites? Like it's hormonal. And... It, it does. Okay, so it depends on the situation in which the nip happens. The first thing one should always do is stop and look at the situation and go. Um, what did I do? <laughs> what did I do wrong? Um, how was I approaching the bird? What is the context that is happening in the room? All that sort of stuff. Because sometimes it's just the littlest bite that's a warning that's saying, hey, go away. Um, and as a veterinarian, I get that a lot because I try to ask my patients to step up onto my hand. And there's some patients who are like, okay, I'll step up on your hand. And other patients are like, I don't want to step up on your hand. And I get plenty of little like warning, like just bite to say like, hey, leave me alone. Don't, don't uh, ask me to step up. And that's acceptable in that particular situation in a veterinary hospital in a home situation if it is if we can you know nail it down to say that it's hormonal i mean that they bit because it's hormonal first off step away and make sure that you're okay you know make sure you don't have your bird still hanging on your hand yeah. <laughs> um, step away for a moment you're okay take a breath relax 
look at the situation. How did this happen? Okay, what do I need to do? Why was I approaching the bird? Do I need to move the bird somewhere right now? Do I really need to engage with the bird? If I do, I need to figure out how I can ask them to step up in a different way or ask them to move to where I want them to in a different way. Um, if I have them target trained and I can get them to like follow a target to their cage, if I need to get them into their cage, then that's a nice, totally acceptable way to ask a bird to go into its home because you're getting a reward. A bird's getting a reward at the end of going into its cage and a bird's going to be happier with that sort of thing than being forced to go into its cage. Um, so, uh, it does depend on the situation, but keep calm and assess why it occurred and what you need to do. Keep your cool. Yeah. All right. All right. There we go. Um, so we're out of time and um, gosh, that thank you for writing us, uh, for giving us the bird's point of view. I love that. Uh, we should... <laughs> I have my favorite shirt on. Oh, there we go. 50 yep. years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the shirt you guys said for Arroyo that he said I could have. <laughs> That's right. Arroyo. And he's celebrating the big 10. So uh, that, that'd be all fingers if he had fingers on his, uh, on his feathers here. Um, that was a great presentation. And I, so, it, so you mentioned um, Arroyo's birthday. We, we have the big giveaway now because it's, we're, we're, we're really celebrating his birthday. And that means da, 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 that we have uh, 10 uh, t-shirts that you just showed off uh, to give away as well as the advocate bundles. Um, so because not only yeah, it's Arroyo's uh, 10th birthday, it's also the advocate's 40th birthday. Oh, wow. And when you combine all that together, it's the Vivirnucci Berry's 50th. So we're like celebrating so many milestones here. Um, so I got to announce the winners, uh, our 10 winners of today's like really insanely big and cool giveaway. The 10, uh, the, the Fever t-shirts and the advocate bundles. Um, let's see. Drum roll, please. Everyone listen up. This 10 people. Here we go. We got Carolyn uh, Higa, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Don Marie um, Hankeman, uh, Janet Greenman, uh, Susan Knoll, Lori Berkeley, Sunny Quinn, Debbie Quinlan, Laura Bracken, Susan Link, and Carol Perry. Congratulations um, to our giveaway winners. The Fiber Office will be reaching out to you to know where to send all that, those goodies to. Um, also another, so we'll be back on next Friday with uh, Dr. Tom Tolley for another episode of Ask the Bit. So um, stay tuned. If you have any questions about your bird's health, tune in, uh, join us on Friday, uh, next next Friday. And then we'll be uh, right before the, the uh, spring break. So speaking of spring. So here's some good takeaways to take into the spring break with you and your flock. <laughs> um, thank you again, Dr. Lamb. That was very informative. And once again, uh, excellent. Um, uh, PowerPoint presentation. So, right. All right, guys. Uh, I last time I think I sang happy birthday by myself because I didn't realize that like no one, I'm not going to hear anyone, I'm not going to sing happy birthday alone this year to Royal, but maybe we can all, I'm going to let all of you at home sing happy birthday to Royal um, on the count of three. One, two, three. And I'll just kind of like gently say it. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Okay, I'm going to do jazz fingers. There we go. All right, guys. Oh, my goodness. Sorry, I, uh, Brenda, thank you for reminding me. There's a discount code. Before it logs off, don't forget, there's a discount code in honor of Arroyo's birthday. It's a 10% off um, limit one per customer per order, and it's good for two weeks. The code will be in the e-newsletter this afternoon, so look out for that. Um, and it's the Arroyo coupon uh, for 10% off. Um, Email uh, webinars at lefebvre.com if you do not receive that coupon code. Whew. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Keep me straight here. All right, guys, on that note, happy St. Patrick's Day. Happy birthday, Arroyo. Till next Bye. time, guys. Bye.